Good afternoon and good morning to you if you're on the West Coast. My name is Jose Leon, Chief Medical Officer for the National Center for Health and Public Housing. It's such a great, great honor to um, moderate this session. And we have great speakers for today's webinar, the oral health impact of tobacco, marijuana, and vaping in patients in public housing. This is a live webinar, and before we get started, uh, we would like to thank HRSA for making this uh, webinar possible through a national cooperative agreement. We are very pleased to have three great speakers, and uh, before we get started, we are going to give some housekeeping items. This is a live a webinar, all lines are muted. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, save your questions. We are going to have a Q&A session at the end. You can either ask your question using the chat box, or you can also uh, use the raise hand icon and your line will be unmuted. Today's uh, webinars, we have three excellent speakers from three different organizations. We are going to hear from Mr. Robert Burns. He is the director of the National Center for Health and Public Housing. Then we are going to hear from Candace Owens. She is the education uh, director of the National Network for All Health Access. And then uh, last, but uh, we are going to hear from Sam Joaquim. He is the chief dental officer at Sufo Health Center. Mr. Bob Burns is the director of the National Center for Health and Public Housing in pursuit of improved health outcomes for residents of public housing and other vulnerable populations. Mr. Burns provides leadership, strategic planning, partnership building, and quality assurance in training and technical assistance and research efforts supporting community health centers in or accessible to public housing. Mr. Burns has provided planning, technical assistance, and assessment services to health centers, public housing agencies, and social service agencies nationwide for over 20 years. Candace Owen is the Education Director for the National Network for Oral Health Access. She is a registered dental hygienist and has a master's in public health and a master's in dental hygiene. Candace's experience includes clinical dental hygiene and serving as a dental public health faculty at the University of New Mexico. Her interests include interprofessional education and working with underserved populations with uh, the national network. Candace develops education, educational resources for healthcare providers working safety net settings, including webinars, in-person training, and technical assistance, learning collaboratives, and various publications outside of NOAA. Candace is a dental hygienist for a portable dental program in Denver and is a member of the Special Olympics Colorado Young Professional Board. Dr. Sam Joaquin, uh, under the leadership of Chief Dental Officer Dr. Sam Joaquin, Sioux Falls Health Center has tripled dental services capacity and more than quadrupled the number of Sioux Falls patients receiving dental care. Joining the organizations in 2009, he has had a long career in public health dedicated to making quality services and education accessible to the underserved. As Zufo, he is responsible for the general administration of the dental department, as well as community health and education initiatives. Collaborating with the medical staff, he was instrumental in integrating oral health as a critical part of the overall wellness plan for adult and pediatric patients. His mobile dental and school-based programs bring services and education to elementary schools, nonprofit agencies, farms, and other outlying locations where access to care is difficult. Further, uh, his outreach efforts support events like Give Kids a Smile Day, National Rural Health Day, Make a Difference Day, and other activities that serve special populations like veterans and the homeless. Before joining SUVO, he ran the school-based dental program at the Patterson Community Health Center and was the dental director for the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey's University Dental Center in Newton. So uh, without further ado, I would like to turn it over to uh, Mr. Bur Bob Burns. Good afternoon, Bob. Hi, Jose. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, very much looking forward to the presentation, the discussion a little bit later on, and hope uh, folks will ask questions either um, you know, online or verbally, you know, when we get to that portion. 
and Fide, here we go. So you're just getting the slides ready, that looks good. Okay, I think we're in, I think we're in business here. Let me just make sure my slides are moving. Okay, so today I'm going to, well, just, uh, sorry, just uh, dealing with the, the slides for a minute. Um, Fide, for some reason I can't move my slides. Um, I'm not sure. Do you want to, do you want to just move them? Yeah, I can do it. Okay, so so why don't we just just go to the uh, go to the the, uh, to the yeah that's great okay um, today I'm going to kind of set the stage because we've got uh, Candace and Sam who are you know extremely knowledgeable in oral health and and uh, you know with uh, you know Candace dealing with the broader issues and then Sam dealing with the specifics of what he and his health center have done. Um, and looking forward to that. And I'm gonna talk primarily about public housing um, and the population and some of their issues around tobacco and a little bit on vaping and marijuana. Talk about some of uh, the activities we've engaged in and other entities have engaged in to address uh, smoking cessation. Um, and also talk about a little bit about how health centers and public housing agencies can work together. So there's some material in here and there's more information available on that and then I'm going to talk about resources. So next slide. Um, the public housing population itself, uh, for those not intimately familiar, about 1.8 million residents, about generally small households, two-person households, 38% children, which is why especially the vaping thing is, is quite relevant and secondhand smoke. 59% female uh, and about 35% are, are female headed households, 55% uh, less high school diploma, 83.2% uh, below federal poverty. Um, in fact, for those who are working about 35% about of those who are of you know, uh, working age um, uh, claim wages as their primary source of income, whereas a lot of the uh, elderly and disabled folks uh, rely on social security and that kind of thing. 17% um, seniors, 62 and over, uh, and 21% of households include a disabled member. Um, and so you have a high concentration <coughs> of, uh, of elderly and disabled, which may you know skew a lot of the data um, and a lot of the the health indices as we as we kind of talk about the public housing population okay next slide okay i'm going to refer to to some information that's provided through a great publication that was done by hud in connection with uh, cdc uh, they took uh, hud administrative data on public housing residents and basically cross-tabbed it with um, information from the National Health Interview Survey, as well as a little bit of data from NHANES and Burfus. Um, and it's probably the best data available on the health of public housing residents. Um, and I wanna note, they are expecting an update in summer of 2020, and we're really looking forward to that. This data um, you know, uh, ended uh, at, in 2012, and so we're very much looking forward to the, the new data. But in terms of the overall health of public housing residents, about 36% uh, look at themselves in fear or poor health condition. Now, versus the general public, where only 14% or so have that, that, that viewpoint. So, and that's kind of an indicator of where people see themselves and where their health outcomes are going. 71% um, are overweight or obese, which of course sounds horrible, but the general population number is about 64%. Um, but that's, that's also a very telling number. And of course, a lot of the comorbidities you know, tied in with obesity and cigarette smoking and diabetes and so on. 61% um, uh, see themselves as having a disability. They see themselves as having a disability versus 35% of the general population. 17.6% um, have diabetes versus 9%, 9.5% of the uh, general population. And on top of which, you know, as, as we all know, smoking uh, you know, increases the, uh, the incidence of type 2 diabetes by 40%. So it's a, it's a very relevant factor. Uh, next slide. 
Okay. And in terms of, you know, mental health is always a, is an important issue around use of, of smoking and people getting off smoking. In fact, in the U.S., 40% of all cigarettes consumed by adults are consumed by adults with some form of mental illness. So about 40% uh, of, of uh, public housing residents uh, see, see that they have distress with mental har hardship uh, versus 21, 1.4% of the general public and 11.6% of uh, uh, public housing residents have serious psychological distress versus only 3.7% of the general public. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, and I should mention that with respect to the, the distress uh, measure for public housing residents, you know, that's, a, that's a telling factor because it really, um, uh, it, it really is a measurement of whether or not they see themselves as uh, able to uh, take care of themselves and whether or not they see themselves as able to participate fully in society. So again, um, the link between isolation and, and smoking and so on. So you wanna think about that. Um, in terms of where they get their health care, 30% 30, 30 of public housing residents uh, list their source as a, as a clinic or health center versus only 17% uh, of the, the general population. Um, and, and relative to dental numbers, and we don't have a lot of great uh, in, information on oral health around public housing that comes out of UBS, but 44% um, um, uh, had a de dental visit within the last year in public housing versus 60% of the general pop. Um, and, and this is kind of disturbing, but 17.5% um, of, of public housing residents have, residents have complete tooth loss versus 8% of the general public. Um, so that's a concern. There's not a lot of great information. There is a, a study that was done about five years ago in Boston uh, by the uh, Boston University School of Public Health in conjunction with the Boston Department of Public Health. And interestingly, in their study, they found that public housing residents there about um, uh, had about the same number of dental visits, but only but were less likely to have their teeth cleaned, and were far more likely to have uh, have lost or had extracted six or more teeth. So just just a little bit of information there. Okay, next slide. Okay, on the left you will see basically the numbers for smoking in the U.S. currently. Those are the latest numbers, and that's about 13.7 percent of, of Americans, adults, are smokers. Okay, next next slide. And these are probably the things that are, I guess, most central and things people most often think about smoking and 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 uh, and the maladies associated with it. But we've got 13.6 uh, of, of uh, public housing residents with uh, COPD versus 6% of the general population, 16% of adults with asthma versus 8.7%. And this is just the number that really sticks out, you know, 33.5% of public housing residents current smokers. Now, again, this is, this is 2012 data versus 22% of, of other adults. But that third number is really significant. And, and by the way, that's also consistent with, with a lot of low, low income population, much, much heavier smokers than the general population. Uh, next slide. And these are facts to remember. Uh, approximately a half a million Americans die from smoking each year, including 41,000 from secondhand smoke. Smoking is the number one cause of preventable death in the U.S. and 34 million still smoke. And here's another fun fact for every, for just at round numbers, for the half million who die every year, for every person that dies, about 30 other people have uh, smoking related illness, which, which is actually 15, closer to 16 million Americans, uh, you know, with smoking related illnesses. A third of adults, again, living in public housing, currently smoking. Um, and to address this, um, HUD, working with a lot of other health agencies and organizations, um, implemented a smoke-free public housing rule. Uh, so next slide, I'm gonna talk about that just for a second. And some people had asked about the, some details uh, when some of the, uh, the people signing up for the conference or for the uh, webinar today. So um, in December, 2016, HUD makes the announcement. The rule was effective on the third, which gave an 18 month implementation period. And then effective August 1, 2018, public housing uh, nationally officially went smoke free. And so what does that mean? Next slide. No one is permitted to smoke anywhere inside the apartment building, an apartment building or development, 
or outside within 25 feet of a public housing building, okay? Policy applies to every member of the household as well as visitors, and the policy does, but the policy does not mean that residents who smoke cannot reside in public housing. It just means that they can't smoke uh, on the property. Next. Okay, and, and, and kind of the question on what is and what is not included. Okay, we're talking about lit tobacco products where tobacco leaves are ignited such as cigarettes, cigars and pipes, and water pipes. What's not included, and I'm sure this frustrates a lot of us now based on the numbers of you know, that have been communicated on the great rise in uh, the use of, of vapes, which I think is at about 27% for, for high school kids now. But electronic nicotine delivery systems, ENDS or vapes or e-cigarettes, depending on whichever name you like, uh, is not included. Now, PHAs have the discretion to come up with a vape policy, but most have not. And, and I, I spoke to the folks uh, at Hodge who, who were in charge of kind of smoke free. And as, as far as they know, they could not really give me an example of any, any who are doing this. So if anybody out there has such an example, we'd be, we'd be very interested in, in hearing about it. Next slide. Marijuana, um, of course, is um, uh, a major issue and has been expanded nationally in terms of legality within the states. But in terms of public housing, first of all, it's not part of the smoke-free smoke -free rule. Um, and secondly, it's, it's an item that is governed by other federal laws. And bottom line, it doesn't matter if the states, uh, you know, the state your public housing agency is in has, uh, you know, okayed uh, marijuana use, it's not allowed in public housing because it's, that's federally funded and that's pretty much all public housing. Now, there is some talk about the possibility of, you know, considering medical marijuana on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but again, in speaking to HUD as recently as Tuesday to see if there was an update, they had no uh, examples where, where uh, people are smoking marijuana on public housing grounds. So again, if you've got some examples out there, I'd be very interested in hearing about them. Uh, next slide. Okay, the benefits, uh, 900,000 units impacted by the rule, over 500,000 units inhabited by elderly households with, uh, and with uh, non-elderly uh, folks with disabilities. Uh, Non-smoking residents able to experience health benefits from a reduction of secondhand smoke. Next slide. Okay, also um, housing authorities benefit from reduction of, of building damage and costs and fires and safety issues. So, so it's all good. Next, next slide. Okay, primary, uh, you know, health centers are out there to, to address and partner with housing agencies. The public housing primary care program was, was developed for that very reason. Um, we focus on health centers that are, uh, that are public housing primary care grantees of which there are 107 or another 250 or so health centers that are not grantees, but, but do provide services to residents in public housing and are in or immediately accessible to public housing. Next slide. Okay, there are plenty of uh, um, tobacco cessation support strategies that are being utilized by uh, uh, health centers nationally, uh, you know, they have on-site smoking cessation services, refer patients to smoking cessation, uh, provide a quit line number, offer nicotine replacement therapy, uh, provide quit smoking information, suggest that the patient contact their primary care physician, and so on. So there's a lot out there, but next slide. Oh, back one, yeah, there you go. Um, but there are also a lot of patients with tobacco-related illnesses, asthma, diabetes, heart disease, uh, uh, tobacco use disorder, and, and so on. A lot have been referred to smoking cessation counseling and, and NRT and all that, that kind of good stuff. Next slide. But I do want to mention that although, um, you know, as when everybody's doing the UDS reporting and health centers, they have to identify whether or not somebody has been, uh, you know, screened, and then whether or not they've been referred for services. 
there is kind of that gated community effect. Um, you know, those with a college education, only 7% of those folks smoke. Those with an advanced degree, only 4% of those folks smoke. And people who work in health are much more health literate and focused on this issue and much less likely to smoke. And so that sometimes there's the assumption or the feeling that people aren't smoking anymore, but is that that's anything but the case uh, amongst our population. And so we've got to really double down on the emphasis and the effort to, to make it hard because it's, it's not easy to get somebody to quit. Um, so, so in terms of activities we've been engaging in, publications and fact sheets on the topic, a, a number of webinars over the last couple of years. We've had a learning collaborative and we have a new learning collaborative that will be starting in the new program cycle, July 1, and we'll be focusing particularly on um, people who wanna develop uh, smoke-free programs and partnerships between health and housing. And secondly, techniques uh, to help people quit, particularly those who are really hardcore smokers um, and have had difficulty um, uh, quitting. So we're gonna be, gonna be doing that. Uh, we'll also be probably attacking at the National Training Symposium, which is gonna be June 18th and 19th um, in Alexandria, Virginia. So you can sign up for that. Um, collaboration, okay. Okay, um, we also have a widget which is linked to a whole bunch of different sites, the American Cancer Society, American Lung Association, Smoking Cessation Leadership Center, um, HUD, just a whole bunch of different resources that can help you. Um, and then we participate in a lot of collaborations with those very same groups, with the CDC, Office of Smoking and Health uh, National Partnership Group. And we have been you know, working with uh, them and with different states and part of Project Echoes and some other things that I'll go into more detail in a minute. Next slide. Um, collaboration is a very important part of this whole thing. You want to get people on the ground where they live, so that you want that you know, you want the health uh, the health um, component, you want the housing component working together to get the word out to to get uh, you know residents to healthcare. And fortunately, we do have, a, you know, the numbers indicate a lot of partnership there, but there is room for improvement. Uh, next slide. Um, a lot of folks, a lot of um, health centers and housing agencies have been working together um, using, um, you know, primary care physicians, as well as patient care coordinators. Uh, and community health workers uh, to get uh, information out to people and to help people with enabling services. The Daughters of Charity uh, in New Orleans is one of those. Next slide. Hampton Roads, again, longstanding collaborations, educational materials, clinical site located on public housing uh, uh, premises. But a lot of struggle with manpower and resources to de dedicate to smoking cessation treatment to try to get every but people actively engaged in this because again they have so many folks have so many other priorities next slide um, smoking cessation uh, resources there are a number all of these are active and i'm and if you get the slides you can click on the links but tips from smokers is from cdc and i'm going to show you one of those later on very valued very valuable tool and um, and I'll explain a you know a try a pilot that we did on that in a minute. Uh, HUD has some great guidelines on smoke free. If you click on that and you can get to their site and look up smoke free public housing, and they will they have a complete guidebook on how to uh, implement and the and, and going over the rules regarding smoke free. We have our materials on nchbh.org. The University of California San Francisco Smoking Cessation Leadership Center, great source. American Lung Association, American Cancer Society, the same thing. And of course, the North American Quit Line Consortium. Uh, next slide. Um, when you go to our site, you'll, you can get all of this great stuff, abstracts, webinars, so on and so forth. And again, the Smoking Cessation Leadership uh, a Learning Collaborative, uh, July 2021. Um, next slide. Again, that's how you get to our, our resources. Next slide. The Quitline Consortium has very nice stuff up there right now regarding smoke-free public housing. And it's also a great, if, you're, if you haven't worked with uh, Quitline uh, locally, uh, you can go to your state and they'll tell you how to get in touch with their Quitline. But the Quitline provides a great combination of um, counseling and nicotine replacement. And, and um, Sam will talk about the benefits of doing it through an EHR and a fax, as opposed to just giving a phone number to somebody to get a better result. Uh, next slide. 
Um, Project Echo, uh, cannot say enough good things about this, and I'm gonna give you the link to this, this whole thing in a minute, but including participants from six states, California, Florida, Kentucky, New York, Pennsylvania, and South Carolina, focused on uh, smoke-free public housing and helping smokers quit. And the participants, including health centers, public housing agencies, quit lines, and state departments of public health working together. Uh, we had sessions roughly every, you know, twice a month uh, over the course of a year. Um, it included didactic presentation on, you know, specific topics and clinical issues and so on. Um, case studies, each of the folks from the different health centers or housing agencies, whether or not they were physicians or community health workers or public housing managers would come in with their issues and there would be some discussion and office hours around how to, how to address those problems. Um, and the report for this, which we're, we're very much uh, engaged in and, and looking forward to is due sometime in June. Can't wait because I think there's gonna be a lot of valuable practices in that for everyone. Um, there were over 20 sessions. They're available on YouTube. Next slide. And that is the uh, that is the YouTube address, so you can go up and actually look at each of those sessions, and they're really good. So I, I really encourage you to do that. Next slide. Um, CDC tips campaign. Uh, CDC tips. You've probably seen it. These are camp. If you've seen them. Um, uh, you know, they basically show a smoker talks about their experience and some of them are pretty graphic and, and kind of scary, but they really get your attention. We recently did a pilot with uh, four or five of our health centers um, where we worked with CDC and we provided uh, the health centers with the posters and the electronic uh, messages that they could put on their screens and, and in their lobbies. And they got about a tenfold increase in the number of patients who sought uh, the, you know, smoking cessation. And also the, another byproduct, which was great, it really seemed to encourage uh, clinical staff and, and health center staff to want to work on smoking cessation. So it was really a win-win. Um, next slide. Okay, I'm gonna hold off just on one second and leave you with just a couple of thoughts um, in terms of practices that we found that work across the board and just real quick, establishing reciprocal partnership uh, between health centers and housing agencies, uh, membership on each other's boards, for example, engage with the community, involving the entire care team, medical, behavioral, and oral health, and oral health, including dentists and hygienists. Hygienists can, I mean, play a significant role in identifying and getting people in, uh, to, to focus on oral health. Culturally appropriate health education materials, such as CDC tips. Um, focus on health literacy, because if, if your folks aren't getting the message, um, whether it's a language issue or just the, the sheer complexity of medical lingo, it, it really, uh, really can hurt the effort. Uh, case management, ID the needs, coordinate the care and monitor the progress, leverage whatever resources you have in the community, uh, expand smoking, including churches and so on, expand smoking cessation services, uh, medication assistant treatment plus uh, nicotine replacement counseling is key. Um, um, and also uh, just really quick around messaging. Um, you know, a great bit of, bit of work has been done around messaging and some key takeaways in terms of messaging that works around smoking cessation. Um, uh, frame it as a justice equity issue explain how the industry tactics are driving disparities now, explain other drivers of, uh, of the issue, uh, including uh, discrimination in healthcare access, talk about pressures on people and communities, and, 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 and kind of avoid the, the doom and gloom in one sense, and try well, to talk about minute. the fact that all people are really, um, you know, deserve clean air and, and, and a healthful, healthful life. And the results uh, have been measured to be a lot better. Right now, I'm just going to put on to close out and then I'm going to turn this to Candace. Um, this is a CDC tips um, uh, video. It's very brief, but it, it talks, it's a patient who had depression issues, but also um, is very relative because what triggered her to, to go forward was issues around, uh, you know, dental problems. And after that, we're going to turn it to Candace um, and she can take us from there.
Candace. Great, thank you. Um, I uh, will just uh, go ahead and get started while my slides are being pulled up. Um, as stated earlier, I'm Candace Owen. I'm the Education Director of the National Network for Oral Health Access, or NOAA. Um, like the National Center for Health and Public Housing, we are a HRSA-funded National Cooperative Agreement grantee. We provide training and technical assistance to health centers throughout the country on oral health. Uh, for this portion of the webinar, I'm just going to be discussing the oral health impacts of tobacco, marijuana, and e-cigarettes. Before I start, I'd like to give a little bit of background to NOAA. NOAA was founded in 1991 by a group of health center dental directors, and they identified a need for peer-to-peer -peer networking, leadership, and support. We're a membership organization, and that now includes more than 3,500 dental providers and partners. And pictured there is um, Dr. John McFarland. He's the founder of NOAA, and this is a time before um, infection control. Next slide. Uh, the popular saying is the oral cavity is a window to the body, and so the mouth is a portal of entry for, the, for nutrients, air, bacteria, and despite the existing system of care delivery and insurance payment, the mouth is strongly related to the rest of the body. When the tissues in the mouth are compromised, it can be a source of disease that can spread beyond the mouth. And over the last few years, there have been increased evidence demonstrating the impact of oral health on systemic health and vice versa. Next slide. So here's a little bit of evidence that discusses the oral health and systemic health relationship. You can kind of see how far it dates back to the year 2000. Uh, Healthy People 2020 recognizes the impact of oral health to general health. The 2000 Surgeon General's report states that the control of existing oral infection is clearly of intrinsic importance and a necessary precaution to prevent systemic complications. And the 2003 um, U.S. Health and Human Services um, National Call to Action discusses the burden of oral disease on overall health. Thank you. So when we talk about tobacco and oral health, there are many manifestations that can occur. Periodontal disease can result from uh, tobacco use. This can lead to bone loss, tooth mobility, and tobacco is a vasoconstrictor, meaning that your blood vessels tighten, making it difficult to respond to infections in the body. The teeth and tongue um, can also get stained by the use of tobacco. Dry mouth, dental decay, and old sense of smell are other manifestations that may occur. And oral cancer is one that we hear a lot about when we talk about tobacco use. It's directly linked to it. And the photo that is there is just a picture of oral oral cancer that resulted from tobacco use. Next slide. Marijuana has similar effects to tobacco. Um, there are also implications for the dental visit, uh, including anxiety, paranoia, and um, this also goes for medical visits as well, obviously. Um, heart rates may also be heightened, which requires some mindfulness when administering any type of local anesthesia that might have epinephrine. And on the left side, you can just see some of the oral health effects from marijuana. Next slide. So this is a list um, of studies that um, suggest a relationship between marijuana and periodontal disease. And so um, these are really great articles. So if you're looking for a little bit of evidence or to dive deep, I'd suggest um, looking them up and they're available for your review. Next slide. As I stated earlier, there is a systemic relationship to oral health. When it comes to periodontal disease, there are many conditions that have an association. This includes diabetes, stroke, aspiration, and pneumonia, Alzheimer's disease, and cardiovascular disease. It's important to note that association is not causation. However, many of these conditions are chronic diseases like periodontal disease. So likely by addressing the risk factor for one condition, you'll impact the other. Next slide. There's a study from United Concordia that found that individuals with chronic diseases or um, are pregnant who received periodontal care have less medical costs compared to those that received no periodontal treatment. So uh, they also found in the study that there were also less hospitalization for those who received periodontal care. Next slide. 
So this infograph demonstrates those numbers, the lowered hospital admissions and the lowered annual medical costs for people that had specific conditions. And if they had um, dental care and were getting treated for gum disease, um, the amount of cost savings that they had compared to those that were not getting treated for gum disease and then reducing those hospital visits. Next slide. E-cigarettes are known as vaping, vape pens, e-cigs, and um, these devices release an aerosol upon use. And you can see in the picture that there are many different shapes and sizes for e-cigarettes, making it often difficult to identify, especially um, as a parent looking out for these things um, with your kids. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention states that e-cigarettes are not safe for youth, young adults, pregnant women, or adults who are not using tobacco products. And so these products are emerging and we are starting to learn more about their effects to the body, including oral health. Next slide. In the last year, I'm sure that you all have heard about the lung injury associated with vaping. Um, they call this condition e-valley or e-cigarette vaping product use associated lung injury. And they found that the vitamin E acetate in the vaping solutions are strongly linked to this condition. As of January 14th, there were over uh, 2,600 hospitalizations for eValley reported by uh, to the CDC. So there is a link here that has more information about the condition and you can also see like pretty active updates about the number of hospitalizations and whatnot. The symptoms for this condition include chest pain, increased heart rate, fever, difficulty breathing, um, coughing, nausea. Next slide. The American Dental Association released a statement on vaping. It can be found on uh, the slide link that I have there. And essentially, they state that vaping is not safe for oral health and that it can be as dangerous as uh, regular cigarettes. Next slide. Compared to marijuana and tobacco, there are not as many studies at this point regarding oral health and vaping. However, we can expect this to emerge in the near future. Despite that, given that there are deadly effects of e-cigarettes, it's important for providers to be mindful of patients who are using them. E-cigarettes contain particles of toxic chemicals and metals, which can lead to respiratory disease, heart disease, and cancer. And solutions that have nicotine will have similar effects um, to the nicotine that we see in tobacco products. Since nicotine is a vasoconstrictor, the body can't respond to damage in the mouth as quickly. And so if you have periodontal disease, um, it makes it difficult to resolve it or for the patient to be able to recover from it as quickly. And so uh, nicotine and having a vasoconstrictor are associated with these things in the mouth, dry mouth, um, dental caries, decreased hearing res uh, healing response, and uh, periodontal disease. Next slide. NOAA works with health centers to increase access to oral health care. As Bob was saying earlier, there isn't a lot of data when it comes to dental care access for patients in public housing. And so what we know is that in order for patients to improve their oral health, there needs to be access to oral health care. So I've listed here some resources that can be helpful in determining strategies to increase access to care. For those in public housing, um, oral health access may be a challenge. Health centers are poised to help patients receive oral health care as they're often um, one-stop shops, meaning that they're um, patient-centered medical homes that have many services at in one location, behavioral health, medical, and dental. So one strategy is interprofessional collaboration. This means that primary care providers engage in oral health activities. Often patients are seeing their medical provider, but not their dental provider. And this is as evidenced by uh, data that we see in the UDS, that the capacity of dental programs is about 26 to 27% of medical programs. And so patients getting care in health centers are more likely to be only receiving receiving medical care and not dental. By having interprofessional collaboration, patients are able to get oral health services in the medical clinic, but also can be connected to care through their medical provider, whether that is through referral and also by um, just delivering some oral health services such as risk assessments or oral evaluation and patient education, oral cancer screenings. 
Other options to expand access to oral health care include delivering care off-site, such as through modalities like teledentistry, mobile dental units, or contracting with outside dental providers. And this is also a strategy for clinics that may not have the capacity to increase their patient load. So this toolkit, the last bullet on the slide, um, has many resources and examples of how this can be implemented. And we're also happy to talk that through with anyone interested. Next slide. So here are some resources for tobacco cessation, e-cigarettes and periodontal disease. Um, a lot of um, the tobacco cessation uh, tools were discussed um, by Bob, and I know Sam will also discuss some as well. We also have some resources directly related to oral health, some resources for tobacco cessation, fact sheets about periodontal disease and diabetes. And so um, all of these resources are helpful in identifying the link for, between oral and systemic health. Next slide. All right, so my contact list uh, information is listed here if you have any questions. And um, I'll now pass it over to Dr. Sam Joaquim to give the Health Center perspective. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Candice. Um, uh, I don't know if you could see my slides. I hope you could see my screen. Uh, but um, like was mentioned before, I, I am from uh, Zufal Health Center. We are uh, health center in uh, New Jersey uh, that was started in 1990 as a uh, Dover Free Clinic, became a FQHC in 2004, and uh, was named uh, Zufal Health Center in 2006 in honor of our uh, founder, uh, Dr. Bob Zufal. Um, and we are working on, a, on our 2019 UDS information, but in the meantime, I could uh, uh, share the 2018 um, data, and we're, we see about 40,000 uh, patients. Uh, we're, we're one of the larger health centers in New Jersey, and we have about uh, 7,000 uh, public housing um, patients uh, per year. And so why is this uh, important to us? Um, uh, this topic for a dentist, um, and that's because tobacco is a major risk factor for oral cancer, like Candace uh, mentioned earlier, along with um, alcohol and HPV. About uh, 53,000 um, oral cancer cases are uh, diagnosed per year, leading to almost 10,000 deaths. Um, it is also a risk factor for many uh, other cancers and diseases, um, again, as was mentioned, including uh, card cardiovascular disease. And working in an FQHC offers us a unique opportunity to work collaboratively with our medical colleagues um, to address this um, risk factor. So, um, you know, some people have asked why is this uh, important to us uh, since uh, smoking rates have been on uh, the, the decline. But uh, for us at Zufal, uh, we have a couple of reasons um, uh, to be concerned. Uh, one is that the smoking rates um, in our um, uh, service area, the counties that uh, we serve, have been actually on the rise uh, over the last 10 years. And um, the last uh, data from 2019 shows, shows them holding steady. So if you compare 2011 to 2018, uh, I'm sorry, 17 or 18, you will see that we've had an increase in uh, smoking rates in all uh, the counties that we serve. Um, additionally, uh, the second uh, uh, reason to be concerned is, of course, the vaping uh, epidemic, which was mentioned. So uh, with one in five U.S. high school students um, and one in 20 middle school students having used um, uh, e-cigarettes is just amazing that we are dealing uh, with this, uh, um, you know, uh, epidemic, uh, having already had the experience of dealing with uh, cigarettes and uh, tobacco. But, um, you know, we've had a couple of uh, um, things that um, the state has been doing to help us, and we've been doing some work um, at Zufol to address this. Uh, but one of the uh, most notable things is that New Jersey added um, e-cigarettes to its New Jersey Clean uh, Indoor Air Act in uh, 2010. Um, the age of sale uh, became uh, 21 in 2017. And then the New Jersey parks and uh, beaches uh, became tobacco free uh, and that included uh, vaping. So New Jersey has been uh, very ag aggressive um, with addressing this issue. Um, in 2018, uh, Juul um, flavoring was banned uh, from uh, retail stores, unfortunately, um, um, the sale of uh, menthol flavors, which was not included in the ban, the ban be, you know, uh, 
went up and um, uh, people still have the uh, ability to uh, buy uh, some of this stuff uh, online. Um, and again, this, this uh, um, um, electronic nicotine delivery systems, the ENDS were designed to deliver liquid nicotine to users uh, in the form of uh, aerosol instead of smoke. Um, however, the vapors do contain toxins, metals, and uh, fine particles uh, that could uh, uh, damage um, the lungs, as uh, Candace mentioned. Uh, the flavoring that is used um, is designed for food. It's not really designed for inhalation, and we don't know, um, you know how much harm it's doing to uh, the lungs. None of these products are FDA approved for uh, smoking cessation, and part of the challenge is that we uh, don't know how much nicotine the you know newer generations of these ends contain, whereas we used to know cigarettes uh, contained uh, two milligram of uh, uh, nicotine. The other major uh, problem, of course, is uh, the use of um, THC uh, along with flavoring um, in in some of these devices. And teens have um, figured out ways to take these things apart and fill them with THC, which also has contributed to the um, uh, problem. So for us, uh, some of the things that we have done is uh, try to train our providers, uh, train ourselves, train the community, uh, make sure we improve awareness, work collaboratively with our, um, our partners, try to maximize the use of resources by connecting with others who are working um, on this uh, um, uh, this issue, and then um, focusing on patient education and referring uh, the patients and connecting them to care. So in terms of uh, education, one of the things that we've been lucky to have is a grant from the uh, Department of Health that um, gives us some funding to allow our staff to go out into the schools, um, also to um, local um, um, organizations that uh, have various health uh, healthcare professionals and do trainings. So we do community programs, we train um, uh, children, school-aged children from uh, grade five to 12, and we are in 12 uh, counties. And what you see on uh, the slide is an example of um, uh, one of our staff members doing a program, uh, including some of the um, uh, you know, uh, ends that he's demonstrating. Usually we show them to healthcare providers and nurses and teachers, not so much to uh, kids. We don't wanna give them any ideas. So um, if you look at the data uh, from uh, the last two school years, we have really increased uh, the number of educational presentations that we are doing out in the community from uh, somewhere around uh, you know, close to 4,000 to um, over 9,000 um, this year. That's uh, individuals reached through our presentations. And so more uh, closely in the office, we um, have encouraged um, uh, our providers to talk to the patients and uh, many are comfortable um, um, giving prescriptions to Medicaid patients for over-counter products. Uh, Medicaid will cover these over-counter products if the uh, patient has a prescription. So um, our dentists are very comfortable uh, you know, prescribing for the uh, gum or the patches and um, uh, referring patients um, as needed. And so uh, what we've been doing is uh, training um, our providers to incorporate the ask, advise, and refer model into their, uh, the visit. Uh, this really uh, nicely ties into um, the risk conversations that we have uh, with the patients um, about um, caries, their cancer risk, uh, and uh, perio, uh, again, as uh, mentioned by Candace. So the first step um, in this process, again, is to use open-ended uh, questions, um, ask everyone, uh, try to not be uh, judgmental. And we start by um, asking the patient something like, tell me about your tobacco use. And if the patient says, looks at you funny and says, you know, what are you talking about? I don't smoke, then it's over. We know that um, they don't smoke, but we wanna try to do it in a non-judgmental way and ask everybody so that those who do uh, smoke kind of feel um, comfortable uh, talking about that with us. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see one of our assistants uh, putting the information about um, vaping and the dangers of vaping in some of the goodie bags, especially those that are being given out to teens. I think they're getting a message that um, this is something that is safe and we wanna be ahead of that messaging and let them know that it is harmful. So we're basically giving 
um, all teens in their goodie bags um, information about um, the dangers of vaping. Um, so the last piece of it is, uh, I'm sorry, the, the second piece would be the advise uh, piece. So giving uh, a clear, strong, personalized message to the patients once once you've um, asked. And um, you could say something like, as your dentist, I need you to know that quitting smoking is one of the most important decisions you can make to reduce your oral cancer risk or um, a personalized mes message that says, while you're here uh, to talk about your gum disease, I need you to know that smoking affects your oral health. Um, and you know, the last piece would be the refer, and um, that's where we want to empower the patients to um, follow up and um, take action. Uh, we want to encourage them if they've had success before uh, in previous attempts to build on that and um, find their way again to um, smoking cessation. And uh, we might say something like using support services can more than double your chance. Uh, of quitting. Um, and so wanted to mention the resources that we have available uh, to us luckily in New Jersey, and they include the New Jersey uh, Quit Line, uh, Quit Centers, and uh, Mom Quit Connect. And uh, we've been uh, using a fax uh, form to uh, refer the patients to uh, Mom's Quit uh, Connect, and we are in discussions with them to see if they could um, accept our fax or our electronic referral um, through ECW, so we've we've been working on uh, incorporating incorporating it into our electronic record. So we're uh, excited about that. But uh, Moms Quick Connect is a uh, uh, free resource. It provides unlimited smoking cessation to insured and uninsured patients. Um, it has telephone uh, counseling for our area. Although in South Jersey they do provide face-to-face uh, -face counseling. There's texting support, um, uh, educational and self-help uh, materials, and basically uh, caregivers of children uh, seven years old and younger uh, can receive uh, this benefit, and uh, it does not require us um, to send the patients when they are ready to quit. So we could refer anybody, and they will um, uh, determine if they are um, you know, ready to quit and follow up with them um, accordingly. Uh, this is a, an example of the fax back form that we would receive, and then our fax administra administrator would be uh, responsible for uh, putting that in the patient's chart. Uh, the next slide just shows the uh, quit line referral, which is also a great resource for us. It's a little bit different in that it, they ask us to make sure that the patient is ready uh, to quit before referring them. There are three quit attempts per year, and it consists of two quit coaching calls um, along with some free uh, nicotine patches for uh, qualified uh, callers. And uh, they have to be 18 years uh, or older. And this is an example of the fax back that we would receive. Uh, the quit centers, uh, lastly, are, it, uh, there's 11 of them in New Jersey. So when you look at the colors, these are the places where um, um, the counties that have quit centers, where you see gray, that's mostly our service area, and we do not have uh, quit centers in those areas. So um, it's only actually in one of our counties, and there's a long waiting list, so we currently can't get patients in. But we are in discussions with the Department of Health. We are um, currently uh, talking about a pilot program where we could possibly get quit centers located um, in our sites. So we're very excited. There's a new uh, dental director in New Jersey, and um, we are hopeful to um, be able to work collaboratively on, on this a little bit more. Uh, so just real quick, so the question about tobacco is included in our um, risk assessment. We start uh, around age 10, 11, which is, you know, to kind of coincide with the DARE program. We capture the information in our electronic records. We try to establish uh, self-management goals. If somebody is um, smoking, then we want to focus on that first. It becomes part of the note. We do um, use um, the uh, ADA billing code D1320. And um, just a little bit of information about uh, the increase over the past uh, three years. We went, uh, we started doing some PDSAs in 2016. Last year we had about 1,300 uh, of those um, uh, codes recorded. And this has affected our um, UDS. Um, reporting as well because we're working collaboratively with medical and as you could see once dental started getting involved 
our UDS measure went up significantly. We're currently at 96%. Some other additional report, uh, um, resources were mentioned before, but I also wanted to mention a few that um, um, are easily accessible for teens online or through apps. I will turn it back uh, to you, Fide, uh, and see if there's any questions. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, our panelists uh, for today's webinar, uh, Bob Burns, Candace Owens, and Dr. Sam Joaquin for this uh, excellent, excellent presentation. And we're going to start the Q&A session. Uh, again, if you are planning to ask a question, you can either do it through the chat box or you can uh, use the rise hand, uh, hand icon and your line will be unmuted. Um, hi, Jose. So uh, right now we have a question, actually. Um, this is from Nicole Gallegos, and she says, we're piloting a team-based care at our FQHC. Any resources you can point me? She is an, re she's a registered uh, dental hygienist, um, and she would like some direction on how to start a uh, tobacco cessation at her health center. Sure, uh, this is uh, Candace with NOAA, and um, I, as far as resources go, I would encourage you to kind of explore NOAA's website. We do have some things on team-based care, but maybe coming from the perspective of Sam or Dr. Joaquin, who um, has probably done some of this work boots on the ground before, um, are there any resources that maybe you have used? Yeah, I would definitely recommend, um, you know, reaching out to um, quit centers or if you have if you have uh, you know a quit line or any resources in your state i would definitely start there because we kind of uh, get a lot of our brochures for free from uh, from from those partnerships so if, if there's anybody uh, that you could partner with and they do some of the provider trainings actually for us as well so that's that's um uh, where i would start but otherwise you know um, i would check out the NOAA website um, uh, the NICDR, uh, I believe, has a lot of free brochures uh, that you could uh, order for patients. And uh, my other recommendation would be to start with a small group. If you're starting, you know, start with a small group, figure out what works best for you and spread it from there. Hi, this is Bob. And I, I would just just add on to that. I mean, it's, it's always nice to check in with your own state's tobacco control folks. Um, because a lot of them have uh, have you know great materials available and access to other other sources of care um, if you're looking for that. And in addition to a bunch of the folks, you know the the, the stuff that you guys cited, and I, and I like the Stanford model and some of that material that um, that Candace uh, has on her her site. Um, you could go to the Smoking Cessation Leadership Center, uh, the University of San Francisco. They have kind of kind of a great summary of where everything is. And of course, the American Cancer Society is, is a great source um, and, and, and uh, we'd be happy to help you and, and have a number of those sources cited on our website, nchbh.org as well. Thank you, Bob, um, Candace, and Sam. Is there any other questions? Thank you. Um, yes, Dr. Now we have one more. Um, this is from Jen Carver. She says, um, I am a health educator and often I get asked this question. Is vaping harms the same as smoking for oral health? Is it safe to assume that yes, your risks are similar? Yeah, so similar to um, what I was saying earlier during my presentation, there isn't a lot of long-term evidence on vaping yet, but that there are currently studies being done at the ADA and through other organizations. So we'll probably see more of those results come out here in the future. But um, I think based on um, what we're seeing, you can, yes, you could probably assume that it is damaging to your oral health and especially depending on what is in it. Um, we know that there's a link between oral health and marijuana, same with nicotine. And so um, definitely if those are things that are being used in their vaping products and there is likely an effect to the mouth. Thank you, Candace. Any other questions, Phoebe? 
Not at the moment. I just want to remind the uh, attendees that all the resources will be shared after the webinar. Uh, you, you can uh, the slides and a link to the recording will be available uh, via email. And you can also visit uh, the nchph.org website. And um, are you planning to link the, any uh, this activity, uh, Candice? Yes, um, well, we can also put the recording and slides on our website as well. So that should be in the next week or so. All right, sounds really good. So is there any other questions today? Not yet. And I would like to ask a question to Sam, uh, and this is in regards to uh, marijuana, and I am, I mean, based on, on your presentation, Sam, uh, you are capturing the smoking uh, uh, tobacco uh, data, but is there any any capturing of uh, uh, marijuana or, or, or vaping at this moment? Um, yeah, we're we're talking a lot about vaping, uh, but like I mentioned, I think some of the, uh, you know, what's alarming is some of the teens have figured out how to um, take these uh, pods, you know, apart, especially like the the newer generation um, electronic uh, delivery systems. They take them apart and replace them with a THC, which is the uh, tetrahydro uh, um, cannabinoids that that's you know the for uh, marijuana, and they um, uh, vape that instead. So we are seeing more of that um, happening, and they're actually being very clever about how they, um, you know, use them in the school system as well. It's um, they look like um, uh, USB um, sticks and things like that, and then they each bring in their, um, you know, their their portion, and they they share the uh, the device even in the school. So um, we haven't, um, you know, we're hearing we're hearing things. It's 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 alarming. But um, I don't I don't know how much data um, is out uh, on there. There was certainly an article um, also that I think wor is worth mentioning in the uh, in JAMA where uh, one of the devices has um, exploded in uh, somebody's face and uh, caused uh, multiple jaw fractures. So I think that's another thing uh, to be concerned about. There's a lot of um, you know unknowns with this, but none of it is is good. Thank you, Sam. Uh, any other questions today? No, Dr. Now. Hey, All right. Hey, I just want to throw one question out to Candace and to uh, to Sam. And you know, in the uh, Surgeon General's uh, recently re released report on smoking cessation, you know, they they noticed that or they noted that uh, health professionals are more now likely to advise uh, folks to quit smoking than they were, you know, 20 years ago even. But still, uh, four out of every nine adult cigarette smokers who saw a health professional during the past year didn't receive advice to quit. And I'm just wondering, is, is that something that's kind of a standard part of uh, the protocol that, that Sam, you use at Sioux Fall or, or, or Candace, that, um, that, that oral health and dentists and so on and, and physical health, I guess, docs uh, are providing you know, at their health centers? Yeah, so, so uh, if, if I uh, if I may, uh, basically, we we know uh, that about 96% of our patients have of our smokers have received you know um, a message either in medical or dental some kind of um, you know discussion of uh, smoking cessation and attempt uh, to refer uh, based on whether you know uh, they're ready um, uh, or not to to quit smoking, um, but we also um, in the dental department, like I mentioned, we're kind of keeping an eye out uh, for the teens and trying to educate people. Um, you know, somebody's joking about uh, vaping or um, not taking it seriously. We try to make sure that we give them the information that this is harmful. It's not. It's not. Um, th there's a misconception because it started, um, I guess, as a um, smoking cessation um, thing where where the initial devices had a controlled amount of nicotine uh, the first generation devices there's, there's a misconception that it is safer but with the second third fourth generation devices we have moved so far from that and we don't even know how much is in these devices and the nicotine could even potentially be uh, lethal so. interesting thank you sam 
Well, uh, we are past the hour, so um, to all attendees, uh, this is just a friendly reminder to please complete the post uh, survey. That your information is very helpful to capture new uh, topics and anything that you would like to discuss. Uh, so please uh, don't forget to complete the post survey. Uh, this is information about our national symposium. This one is going to take place June 18th and 19th here in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, you can also join the ma our mailing list. Uh, you can receive uh, HERSA updates, information on funding opportunities. Uh, you can check the resources and services and uh, information on past and up, uh, up, uh, uh, future webinars. You can also visit our website that you can find information on publications, interactive maps, and um, newsletters, and any um, emerging topic uh, regarding public housing primary care or any emerging topic affecting public housing residents. And if you have any questions, you can contact either any of our uh, staff members that we will be very pleased to help you. Once again, I would like to thank uh, Bob Burns, uh, Candice Owen and Dr. Sam Joaquin for this wonderful presentation. And thank you so much and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Yeah.